it's true. I do, I'm on. Okay, great. That sounds louder than my normal voice, so that's amazing. Um, I do do Sudoku, Sudokus. I don't know how to pronounce them, I just do them. Um, I started in fifth grade. Fourth grade actually was like the first time and I became obsessed. But then you know, college hit and I'm like, I should probably study. So I paused for a little bit, but you know, spring break, I'm like, okay, 20 hour car ride, no internet. That's great. I'll bring my book. Um, <laughs> and the only thing for me that's more fun than doing Sudokus is racing someone in Sudokus. So this is how Zach found it out, is I challenged him to a race, and then I really beat him. <laughs> and then I really beat him again another time because he wanted a second chance. So <laughs> if you want to talk about my strategy, it really freaks some people out, but we can talk. That's not why we're here. Um, <laughs> so come find me later, and we can just do them all together, and it will be great. We can race. I love that. Okay. So welcome to crew. Um, if you don't know me, I'm a first year intern here, and I will actually be coming back next year to do a second year. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm glad you are, because. <laughs> That would have been awkward. Um, <laughs> but this past month, we've been in this series called like Set Apart to be Holy. Um, and really like diving in like, what does holiness mean and why does it matter? Um, like how are we set apart for this holiness? And we're looking at it through the theme and the lens of the book of 1 Peter. So Eric made this slide, just giving credit where it's due. And I figured before we dive in, we should give you like that Netflix season episode recap in case you missed it. So here's what you missed in Set of Parts Be Holy. Episode 1. Abby taught from 1 Peter 1 about how our inheritance from what Jesus did through his death and resurrection is what enables us to become holy. Episode 2, Eric taught us for how God has enabled and wants all people to be holy. Episode 3, Mal taught how holiness is marked by loving and blessing those who wrong us and insult us. And Ian taught us last week from 1 Peter 4 how the law is what dictating what is holy in the Bible for our own good to protect us and to guide us. But before we go any further, because I'm just going to start rambling, we're going to pray. So, bow your head with me. Great. Um, Lord, just thank you so much for this night and this opportunity to just talk about you, who you are, and what it truly means to be holy. Allah, I invite your spirit into this present to begin working and continue working in the lives of the students and even my own life as well, on top of it. Allah, give me the words to say that you want people to hear. I pray your Holy Spirit is multitasking in their lives and in my own life. And I also pray that you just give us a sense of peace and calm and togetherness to really wrestle and take to heart what does it mean to be holy set apart. Amen. Okay. So I figured before we go like too far down the rabbit hole, we need to really discuss what does it mean to be holy. So holiness happens when we place our trust in Jesus. So if you're here tonight and you're like, oh my gosh, I this is about Jesus, welcome. <laughs> That's okay that you're there. Um, but I really want to invite you to listen and to dive into what does this mean, like who is this Jesus and how does this impact my life. And then if you're here tonight and you're like, yeah, I know him, Jesus, he's cool. Um, I want you to listen intently and think, where can I invite God more into my life? And what have I been holding back? Okay, so holiness. This isn't some nice, intangible, abstract, philosophical idea, but it's actually a command. We are called to be holy. And 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, when you sum it up, it says we are commanded to be holy in our thoughts, feelings, and actions because God is holy. And so it's a set apart because God is set apart. And so I brought a chart with me. Wow, you might have seen this before. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you haven't seen it before, don't feel left out because I think it's super helpful. So we have, and I was a psych major, so charts, I really dig them. But <laughs> we have... This is like the human life. Everyone comes into it and they're just doing their thing. And then there's this pivot, this V in our lives to where we decide and we realize, oh my gosh, I have done messed up, which is the bottom line. I cannot fix it. And then we have the top line of, oh my gosh, God will never accept me. 
And when we first realize this, we are like, I need something to fill that. What will fill that? Jesus. That's what the cross represents. Jesus fills that void every single time. And I think what's also important to know is it's not like God automatically like changes to be more holy and we don't automatically become more sinful, but it's our awareness of both. And a good analogy for this is, okay, was I the only person in like second, third grade who had to do those math tables? Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, <laughs> like, you had to do all these things, and I remember sitting on my kitchen floor and being like, I want to drop out, and I'm in second grade. But I didn't. <laughs> but when you learned them, you learned addition first, and then you learned subtraction, and then multiplication, and then division. So it's not like second grade Rachel was learning addition and then learned multiplication, and then it was like, oh my gosh, the whole nature of math shifted and added on to something. It was, oh no, I'm just learning more about the subject. And I began to learn more. And then, you know, I endured geometry and algebra and statistics moving on. <laughs> but in the same way, it's not that the nature of the subject changed, it's I learned more about him. And we also learn more about God, and we learn more about ourselves, and the lines become farther. But honestly, like, we don't like seeing that. We don't like knowing we're so far apart and so far removed. Um, we don't like seeing the depths of our brokenness, and so we'll minimize the cross, which is this one, and make it smaller. And so in the smallerness, we minimize it by thinking, I'm better than I truly am, or we impact God's holiness of, he actually doesn't require that of me. And both of these are really dangerous. Because instead of now trusting Jesus to fill this void, we're trusting ourselves. And we're changing and thinking God is not as holy as he truly is. And so holiness isn't something like we earn. It's not like I can do enough things and then I become holy. But it's actually once I made that initial decision at the V, I become holy because now Jesus stands for me. He stands in the gap. It is a gift. And in light of the gift of holiness we've been giving, we need to dig in to how this holiness changes us. And we really need to fight against this. And we really need to let the cross fill the void of our life. Because God wants us to live differently because we've been set apart because of our belief in Jesus. And we need to begin to trust God to change our thoughts, actions, and behaviors. And beliefs. That was another one. And he had mentioned last week how this change will cause others around us to be surprised by our decisions when we decide to not do things we initially used to do. It changes us. We become different. And so in 1 Peter 5, a big theme of it is humility and humbleness. Great, what's the connection? That was my thought. I was like, God, I, okay, great. But <laughs> Peter calls us to live humbly by inviting us back to see God for who he truly is, that first line. Not who we say he is, but who he is. And he also invites us to see ourselves as we truly are. And not how we would like to see ourselves. And so when we live this way, it leads to four things. We're commanded to be humble. We'll see that. We gain a right view of God's character. We resist and are aware of what stops us from viewing God rightly. And we have hope for the future. So if you're a map person, this is your map. Have fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> so now we'll go into what does Peter actually say. And we're actually only going to be focusing on six verses of 1 Peter 5. And so it's going to be from 1 Peter 5, 5 through 11. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, 
confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so we're commanded to be humble. Verse 5, part B. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but because pride goes against his very character. I, I could go on this long tangent of, like, beginning of the Bible, Genesis, God creates good things. He creates us. And then we basically are like, nah, I know better than you, Dad. I'm going to go do this thing. And in that pride, we brought our sin and this brokenness into the world and upon us. And so, of course, God opposes the proud. The proud doubt who he is. The proud go against his character. If God is all good and he created us and we said, no, all this good is not what we want, of course it's going to be bad because the only opposite of good is bad. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> like, he's the only one who has made no mistakes. He has never messed up. But yet he still chooses to focus on others. Think of Jesus. God has to be others focused. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent Jesus to the cross for our sins. Jesus left his home, came to our broken world. He left every comfort he had. And I could go on about the magnitude, about what Jesus did, but I want to take us to what Paul writes about it in Philippians. And so Philippians 2, 5 through 8 from the Message Version says, Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He has equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges, Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, and then he died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Like, I don't, like... <laughs> I, like, have no words. Like, this is why we're reading it from the Bible instead of whatever I could think of. Like, that is what God did for us. Like, he chose that humility. He chose to enter in. And as we are called to be like Jesus, that means we are called and commanded to be humble. And so then my brain began thinking, like, okay, now we've defined holiness, so what does humility mean? And I, if the Sudoku thing didn't give away, I tend to be a nerd, okay? Um, spoiler alert. And so I looked at the <laughs> Greek word for humility, and it's this fancy thing. Um... Yeah, and then I listened to it like five times, and I'm still probably going with it, but it's tapa no fushune. Good luck. And it was like seven times, it was a whole thing in Starbucks, but tapa no fushune. And so these are the three definitions the commentary I was using, Blue Letter Bible, has for it. So having a humble opinion of oneself, a deep sense of one's moral littleness, modesty, humility, lowness of mind. And I don't know about you, but I have a problem when, like, the word we're trying to describe is used in the definition. Mm -hmm. Like, that doesn't help me understand the word. Um, <laughs> like, it doesn't. And so I really locked in on the second point. Like, a deep sense of one's moral littleness. Um, and I recently became aware of my physical littleness over spring break in Salt Lake City. Some of you, the majority of you, have probably heard this story by now, but, you know, we were all there, having a fun time, and they have these electric scooters you can rent. <laughs> and, yes, and so Eric Horner on staff is leading the way. It's me, Michael's behind me, and then two other, three other students are behind him, and we're all just cruising along, and they go 10, 15 miles an hour, and because of that, they're illegal to ride on sidewalks. So you're in the bike lane with traffic in Salt Lake City, which is very different from the traffic here in Stevens Point. <laughs> and as we're riding, all of a sudden, I get this tingling sensation of something is coming up behind me. That something is big. 
that something is fast, that something is going to hit me. <laughs> that's like literally my thought process, and I'm like trying to look ahead, and we've literally been on the scooter for like 10 seconds at this point, so it's still new, and I don't quite really know how it differs from my Razor scooter from one fourth grade, except it goes faster, so I'm like, oh no, this is awful, and I'm trying to see like, where is Eric, and I'm also worried about like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what this thing is, and I'm responsible for four human lives behind me, like what is going on, and so all of a sudden, I like, realize it's the public city transportation bus of Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> In dead <laughs> intersection point with Rachel Zenezek not wearing a helmet, please don't tell my mom, on an electric scooter in the street. And so my body just like kind of does that adrenaline thing of just like get out of the way. And so I like go almost down a parking ramp and just throw my body off of it, and I land on my feet, it's fine, but I did break a chato. Um, they got re -strapped. we can talk more later, but I wanted to bring, like, it was, it was really scary, actually, we can laugh about it now, but I did almost die, um, <laughs> because, you know, like, in the case of bus versus Rachel, my money is on the bus, <laughs> it's not on Rachel, and I felt in that moment, like, really vulnerable and really exposed and even kind of ashamed and I was like oh my gosh I literally almost died Michael's nodding because I literally almost died um, and I was like that could have been so bad but it wasn't thank you public transportation for letting me see how little and vulnerable I actually am in this life but I also want to give you guys like a picture of like how does this play out in our morals because it's not just physical littleness. And I thought uh, it might look like this office clip. So Kevin, if we have that, um, give it some grace because I can't find it on YouTube. So we're going to the Netflix stores. But I really thought it would be just great. Jim, there's a sales manager position open in Stanford. You want me to call Jan and tell her you're interested? I can put in a good word for you, because I'll still be working here. Everybody, transfer, transfer, transfer. <laughs> okay, you two in the conference room with me. Nobody leaves until we work this out. Cage match. Cage matches? Yeah, they work. How could they not work? If they didn't work, everybody would still be in the cage. <laughs> no words. Someone replaced all my pens and pencils with crayons. I suspect Jim Halpert. Everyone has called me Dwayne all day. I think Jim Halpert paid them to. <laughs> yes. Five bucks each, and it was totally worth it. This morning, I found a bloody glove in my desk drawer, and Jim Halper tried to convince me I committed murder. <laughs> Maybe real murder. Jim Halpert said there was an abandoned infant in the woman's room. When I went to save the child, I saw Meredith on the can. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, I knocked myself in the head with the phone. <laughs> that actually yes. took a while. I had to put uh, more and more nickels into his handset until he got used to the weight, and then I just took them all out. Every time I typed my name, it said diapers. Just a simple macro. And these actually don't sound that funny one after another. But he does deserve it, though. By the end of the day, my desk was about two feet closer to the copier. Yeah, I just <laughs> moved it an inch every time I went to the bathroom. And that's how I spent my entire day that day. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, yeah, I love that clip for this point, because you see Jim slowly put together the hurt he's caused to wipe. You slowly see him realize, especially in the, well, he does deserve it, doesn't he? I'm not doing anything wrong. And you begin to see how aware of his littleness he has become. And, you know, like, we try and pretend we're okay, and we avoid the reality, and honestly, like, the world and culture doesn't really give us an explanation to that. 
but we're called to step into that pain and to acknowledge our littleness and be okay with it because the God we serve is so much bigger and greater than that. And the whole, you know, back to the chart, cross covers it every time. So point two, living humbly means we gain a right view of who God is. And, you know, this happened to me in high school. Gained a better view of God as I started applying to colleges. Hated the whole process. Didn't want to go. Obviously, spoiler, I went. Um, and I wonder, I had like all these worries, all these anxieties. Would I make friends? Will they like me? Um, will I lose all my friendships? Oh my gosh, this is the worst. I'm going to die. Um, and then on top of it, all my classmates are applying to Brown, Princeton, Stanford. And there was an unlike bespoke rule in my high school that I'm going to be there too. Um, but I just went to UW schools. And not the big Madison one, small ones. And I had all these anxious thoughts running through my head. And I needed to like really make a decision. So I asked a leader in my church to pray for me. And so for three days he prayed for me. And when he came back, he said, you're going to Stevens Point. To which I almost laughed because it was my last choice. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> but you can't really ask him to go back and pray for you more. Because he just prayed three days. And I was like, oh, oh then I should pray for it. And as I prayed over it, it was the first time I actually got excited for what God had for me in college. Um, and I'm like, okay, that's it. Great. Sign me up. End of story. But then I had to tell my high school college counselor advisor person. And when she asked why, because it stands point was so low on my list, I was like, oh, I prayed for it. That's where I'm going. Her face was not amused. She was like, okay, so you're going because you think God wants you to go there. Yes, you got it. <laughs> and she like was just so confused and couldn't understand who or why or what that is. And it's because God to me was so much bigger than that decision, but God to her probably didn't even exist. And so that's what verses 6 and 7 say. Like It says to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And when talking about humility, we can have that reaction of my high school counselor of, like, you're doing what because who is telling you to do that? And throughout, and if we don't know who we're humbling ourselves to, or if we don't like who we're supposed to submit to, we have that reaction. And all of First Peter is Peter saying, no, you are called to submit and humble yourself. You are commanded to because it sets you apart. And so I have some questions for you guys. How many times a day do you worry if you've done enough? Do you worry of failure? Do you worry of shame? Do you worry over potential mistakes? But more importantly than all those questions is this. Do you believe God cares about what you worry about? Do you believe God loves you, likes you, and sees the pain you experience? When we begin to let our fear and anxiety of the future drown out the truth of God's love and care, we begin to shrink the power of, the, of Christ's death and resurrection in our life. We begin to do everything we can to get what we think we need instead of slowing down, trusting the Lord, what he's already done and still doing in our lives. And when you begin to feel stressed about your future and life, what's your first reaction? To stress and control? Or humble yourself to the character of God and trust him to do new things. It's definitely not natural to trust God or his character in this way. In fact, everything in our culture goes against it. But if we doubt God's ability to care for us, then we will fight against humbling ourselves to God because we think God doesn't know us or care for us. I said that fast and I'm going to say it again because I want you to get it, which is why I said it fast. But if we doubt God's ability to care for us, then we will fight against humbling ourselves to God because we think God doesn't know us or care for us. Verse 3, or point 3, in verse 8, to the first part of 9. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm and resist. If you're... I think I messed something up there. Do we have that on the slide? 
Firm in your faith, resistant. Yes, stand firm. Okay, great. We're biblically sound. Um, <laughs> I just had a, woo, that was almost bad. Okay, great. We need to know who God is, but we also need to be aware that there is a very real enemy prowling around looking to consume us. Our enemy doesn't want us to trust God. He doesn't want us to believe in God. He wants us to sit down and be passive and trust ourselves because we fail a lot. Just like I did in elementary school on those math tables. Um... And if we're not watchful, we speed our lives up, and instead of doing what God wants to do, we begin to do what we want. And that's what happened when I chose UWSP. I slowed down, and I listened to what God wanted. My guidance counselor did, didn't know to do that. I needed to be aware I was making the best decision God wanted for my life, not the decision I thought would be best. The way we grow into being so able to be sober-minded and watchful is by growing in our relationship with God. We need to be able to know who he is and trust him. And that is, I made a math equation I like. Well, I like statistics, but I put intimacy with God equals trust plus time. You need to have time and grow in your trust of God, and that will equal a greater intimacy with the Lord. And then you'll be able to know what you're watching for and fight against the enemy who's crawling around you and stand firm. You're and this growth is like the op opposite of sloppiness, which is what we're called against when we're called to be sober-minded. And that's what verse 9 says. Like, we have the power to resist the enemy, and we have been given all authority to do so. And so we don't have to fight back or defeat him. We just have to resist and stand firm in what we've already been told. Okay, point four. We have a hope for the future. End of verse 9. Knowing the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world, and after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. I listen to the command to live humble, and I biff it a lot too. Don't hear me say I do it perfectly. But I listen to the command, trust God with my anxieties, and resist the enemy, because in heaven Christ himself will restore me, confirm me, strengthen me, and establish me. And if you believe Jesus died and rose again for your sins, he will also do the same for you. Like, this is what we're going to. This is like, our GPS isn't set for graduation. Our GPS isn't set for getting this great job in the lake house and some fish thing that I don't understand, but all you guys really enjoy. <laughs> Insert that here. Um, like, that's not our destination. Our destination is this verse. Everything I've said leads up to this verse. Even though you suffer now, in heaven, you will be restored, confirmed, strengthened, and established. And it's a mental game, and I think of swimming, and I think of swimming the mile, specifically. I swam up until my freshman year here at UWSP, and I would do 500 yards, the 1,000 in the mile, and when my coach gave me a sprint, I would do 200 yards. Um, and so when you swim a distance race, you have this thing called a counter. I think I have a picture. Yeah, so it will like keep count of how many laps you do so you don't have to. And then when you see the orange square, you just know you need to race to the end. You just need to touch the wall and you're done. But as you race, you need to pace yourself to do the race well. You need to know what you're going to, you need to know what you're about, and you also need to know your pace. And so you don't dive into the pool and sprint it and then die. I've been there. You pace yourself for your specific time and your goal. But no matter how much I've trained, there's always a middle ground of, oh, can I make it? This is painful. Can, can, can I make it? Can I make it to the red square and then to that end? Or do I need to hang out on the lane line? There's no one else in the lane. It's just you. You know you have your coach cheering you on. You know you have the person holding the counter for you. But it's you. You're the only one. 
who has the power to say, I am going to hold on and I'm going to do this well. I will finish strong. And so you sacrifice some more air and you kick a little harder and you pull a little stronger. Because you know the pain of swimming this mile will last and you will go into the glorious warmth of the hot tub. <laughs> you, oh, it is glorious, let me tell you. And I know I will be restored and I will be redeemed and I will be strengthened and confirmed and established once I hit that wall and I will hear my coach say, well done. And I tell you this because we're all in the middle of swimming this mile. Some of us may be farther, some of us may be just starting, some of us may be in the middle somewhere, but like we're all in this mile race. And so we need to pace ourselves to finish well, but we also need to not sacrifice our fear of losing something losing our energy or losing anything, that's when your coach says, mm, you could have done more. And that's what verse 11 says. To the dominion and the glory of God forever and ever, amen. It's all him. He has all the power. He has already won it. We are already his. We are already bought. And so I want to leave you with this as we wrap up. Our series, kind of our semester, that's our next week, so we'll Pass that to Ryan. But, <laughs> like, I want you to remember Jesus is what makes you holy. It's not what you do, it's who you are. And you can choose to press into that, or you can choose to press away with it. And I also want you to remember your anxiety, your worry, your fear, it doesn't impact you, it impacts Jesus. Give it to Him. He cares, He's seen it, He's experienced it. Pass it to Him because he loves you and he likes you and he is waiting for the day when he is able, the God of all grace is able to say, well done, come to me, let me give you rest. And we see that in our life right now of people wanting to do that. But I found the only thing that stops me from doing this is my pride and thinking I can't do it. And tonight I want to invite you as the band comes up to just sacrifice that and to really think through, is your pride enough for you? Or are you like Michael to where you're at a point and you're ready to let it go? And you're ready to let it all go? So I will pray to close this. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for just your word and what you've called us and given it to us more. Abba, I pray over these people in my own heart that you allow us to see how you've called us to live humbly and to walk in power of you and that you are a good God who wants to give good gifts to his children even though we don't deserve them, even though we've done nothing to deserve them. You want to care for us and you want to love us. And I just pray you give us the strength to believe that that is enough. In your name, amen.